Hello ballers and welcome to the latest video in the how to think like a pro guide series. My name is Steven and in today's video we'll be covering the differences between and the drafting of breakouts and game plans. By the end of the video you'll have the tools you need to create game winning breakouts and game plans no matter the layout. If you'd like to see more on this topic be sure to join us live every Thursday at 8 p.m. where we cover more breakouts and game plans specific to the layouts you're playing. If you enjoy the content we make on this channel and are looking for ways to support us click the join button to become a super valuable player today. Lastly be sure to join our discord server where we discuss all things paintball and expose each other's toxicity in 4K. Nope. Hold up. Wait a minute. Something ain't right. Nope. Let's get started. Before we get into drafting breakouts and game plans, we need to know the differences between the two. A breakout is what we do within the first few seconds of a point. A game plan gives us a purpose and helps inform what we do beyond the breakout. Your breakouts should seek to maximize the pressure applied to your opponents while minimizing the risks you take to do so. Whereas your game plans should seek to give your team a uniting goal that will ultimately lead to your victory. We'll give some examples of breakouts and game plans later in the video. Here are a few things you need to know before you can draft an effective game plan. First, use data where possible to make informed decisions. Game plans without data are just guesses. This includes tracking our survival rates going into various bunkers as well as tracking our opponent's breakouts and their survival rates. This informs us on what's working and helps us predict what our opponents will do next. We'll talk about a very practical way you can track your opponents in a minute. Second, strive to have the maximum number of guns up where possible. This means that if your opponents are not able to stop you running five guns off the break, you should run five guns until they do stop you. Because our opponents are often as skilled as we are in a tournament setting, we're usually only able Able to have three to four guns up off the break. Anything less than this is an indication that your game plan is conceding too much ground to your opponents. Third, never send two players to the same zone in a breakout. It should be obvious as to why not, but we'll talk more about this later. And fourth, leverage your opponent's tendencies against them. For example, if you notice that your opponent's back player almost never goes up the center off the break, how might that inform your breakout? Or if we notice that as soon as their front Dorito player makes it to his bunker, he's on his feet looking to make his next move right away, what kind of breakout can we draft to capitalize on this? Now, let's talk about a really easy way to track your opponent's breakouts. So a tool that we must utilize is some sort of tracking of what our opponents are doing off the break. So let's say, for example, in point number one, our opponents send a guy here, 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 and here. And let's say in point number two, they send a guy here, 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 and here. The other thing that we can use to help inform us in how our opponents are succeeding at their breakouts or what it is that they're doing exactly is to also write if we shot anybody off the break and in which point we did so. So let's say, for example, in point number two, we, we shot both their Dorito one and their snake corner runner. That's how we would indicate that. So why is this useful and how is this helpful? Well, the reason it's useful is because, again, we're using data to inform our game plans, which then we can create very high hyper specific game plans to counter not only what they do on a consistent basis, but also what we assume they're going to do next point based on trends and patterns. So let's say, for example, they go to the Dorito for the first three points that we play against them. And we're wanting to know what are they going to do in this fourth point? And let's say that the number two on the Dorito side also went to this bunker every single time. Well, let's imagine that in the second and third point, we shot their number one on the Dorito side. So what is it that they're going to do in this fourth point? Well, clearly we have the shot now dialed in to their Dorito runner. So it would kind of be insane for them to go to the Dorito one again with the risk of us shooting them a third time on the fourth point. So what is it that we can assume that they'll do based on that? Well, it's probably that they're going to pull up short on the Dorito side and probably send their number one in the Dorito in this wedge and maybe pull up short on the can here as well and send a guy, their number two, to this can. It's also possible that their number one could also go to this Dorito inside bunker, but without getting too crazy, into like the specifics of this layout. Let's just imagine that we pull them up short in a pretty standard and predictable way. Well, with this information, what is it that we can do? Well, what we can do is we can say, okay, we're going to keep that shot dedicated just to make sure that if they do decide to go there, that we will eliminate them. But now instead of having any sort of standard breakout on the opposite side of the field, where maybe we went to the can and we went to the Dorito as well, we're going to send our number two on the Dorito side up the center of the field to then take over this zone and free up our number three to do whatever. And let's say, okay, we're causing them to pull up short on the Dorito side. Let's punish them for that. And the way that we would do that is we would 
hard push the Doritos side. Now you can go down the rabbit hole very quickly with this. So let's say for example, our opponents knew that they were going to pull up short on the Doritos side. Well, it would probably mean that they're going to do some sort of snake side push. And we would want to make sure we have a game plan to be weary of that or to counter it. It very well could be that rather than dedicating three bodies to the Doritos side, we simply dominate the same lane that we have been and do kind of a slow push on the Dorito to get up as far up to the field as, as we can, but not super fast. And rather instead we send the number two on the Dorito side, or maybe even the number three to then hold this kind of bait into this gap, because we know they're going to push this direction. And we know they're going to play very cautious and conservative off the break on the Dorito side. So there's obviously a lot of things you can do with this information and none are more correct than the other. It's really just a matter of how you think you can exploit what your opponents are going to do based on what they've been doing. Another thing to consider when creating layouts is that you don't want to risk two bodies in the same zone off the break. So say, for example, you wanted to send a guy to this wing on the snake side and a guy to the snake corner off the break. Let's say even you wanted this dude to run and gun and you wanted this guy to run with his gun down. Well, what's the problem with this play? The problem is that these two guys are being shot by the same zone from the home. It might be that you want both your players to go to those bunkers, but you might have to have a delayed push where this guy floats out in some kind of dead zone. And then as soon as this dude dives into the wing, hopefully survives, then this guy can go after the fact because now you've drawn the guns short towards the wing, which frees up this entire zone back here for you to freely go to the corner. But if you try to go this off the break, it's very easy to fan your gun up and down when you're shooting one zone to hit both players. And so it's too risky to do this. So what might an actual game plan look like? Well, let's say we knew that if we got into the snake, our chances of winning the point dramatically went up. So what we have to be asking ourselves is how do we get into the snake? And asking yourself that question is what will help create a game plan because we've established that we can create breakouts, but breakouts don't typically inform players how they will achieve their goals. So we know that we want to get into the snake. How do we do so? Well, let's say that the number two is going to float out in this dead zone here for a second while the number three runs up and shoots towards their snake runner. And we know we want to get into the snake, but we know it's too risky to get there off the break. So instead, we're going to send a guy to the God Bunker and he's going to draw guns. So as soon as he gets to the God Bunker and either draws a gun or is able to also control what's heads up in front of him, then this guy in the dead zone is going to then float out to the corner and establish control on the wide side of the snake. As soon as he establishes this control and he communicates to his snake guy that he has control, this snake guy is going to immediately dive into the wing and then dive into the snake. As soon as we get into the snake, we're going to support that push by setting up our number three to this wedge. And he's now going to alleviate whatever sort of pressure is being applied to the Dorito side because we're now making a three man push on the snake. We have two people over on the Doritos and all they're essentially doing doing is surviving. That's their whole mission is to survive. So now if this number three needs to help support the snake side push, he can then in his position, change guns, wrap on the field and start to chop off various zones to then punish our opponents for not matching this. Or let's say we know that they like to pull up short on the Doritos. So how can we capitalize on that? What is it that we need to do to punish this play? Well, we kind of already touched on this earlier, but that might be that we say, how can we get up to the Doritos as fast as possible? Well, if they pull up short, then maybe what we do is we send our number three three straight up to this tower. We send our Dorito one to a conservative break and so does our Dorito two behind him. As soon as our number three gets established and can hold this zone, we then free up the number two behind him to make some sort of up the gut move to then take over this zone. And then by doing so, we free up our Dorito to instantly take this ground right here because we have two people who can now safely target both of these two players and apply a lot of pressure to them and still freely get our Dorito one player up the field. Okay, well, I hope that helped. I hope you guys found that very valuable and uh, let me know in the comments if you did. Hopefully these examples help you understand not only how we collect data, but also how we apply the data we collect to our breakouts and game plans. If you're still having trouble drafting effective breakouts or game plans, here are some questions to ask yourself. What are the strengths and weaknesses of my breakout or game plan? Does my breakout or game plan exploit the resources I have at my disposal, i.e. my player's skills and athleticism? Does my breakout account for the fundamentals we talked about earlier? Is my game plan straightforward and easily accomplishable? And is my game plan actually leading towards victory. Hopefully these questions will help you refine your breakouts and game plans you draft in the future. I appreciate everyone who's made it this far in the video. If you did, comment down below saying Baba Booey. Remember to check out our Discord server in the description below where you can ask for help in drafting effective breakouts and game plans for whatever layout you're playing. I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video, but until then, stay safe and have a good one.